Now let's observe Jonah's bad day. The whole bad day was caused by a bad attitude. And I mentioned to you that there are eight scenes in this book, eight scenes. And um, these last two scenes, Jonah complaining and Jonah corrected of what we're going to focus in on. I will tell you as a child when I would develop an attitude, perhaps because I was asked to do something I didn't want to do, I could at times be found pouting. I know you never did that. Frowning, <laughs> scowling, complaining. And my mother would say from me, for, to me from time to time, from time to time, Cal, you have a, a rotten attitude. And I knew that that was getting close to the end of this kind of response. Because uh, if I didn't stop it, uh, she was going to give me a reason to continue my pouting and scowling and acting discontented. And um, um, she would call that an attitude adjustment. So does anyone here know what an attitude adjustment is? Yeah. You're probably the better for it, right? Um, attitude affects everything. It's the lens that we look through which ultimately affects our judgments. In chapter 4, we observe the prophet reflecting a very bad attitude, even though as a prophet he's supposed to be somebody that represents God's people. And yet we find that he is prejudiced, he's intolerant, he's judgmental. And here's the sad thing. We can be that way and not even see it in ourselves. We've got to be so careful. And God decides to deal with Jonah through an object lesson in chapter 4. And the message is clear. Change your attitude, sir. That's the message. Let's stand together quickly and read this scripture. Um, 11 verses. It, it will go quick. Um, how about I'll just read it and work through it and you follow along. Out of respect, we will stand. But it, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? And therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. I mean, what an accusation, God. You're, you're merciful, too gracious, slow to anger, an abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Uh, harm when I, when I, when I, even when I was still in my country. And therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. Boy, he's in bad shape. Um, I'd rather die than live. And then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade. We call that pouting. Until he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come over, uh, poor old Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant, but as morning <laughs> dawned and the next day God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. <clears throat> Then God said to Jonah, it is right for you to be angry about the plant. Or is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you've had a pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a, in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which you are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? And the book ends. God's done talking about it. Ends. Have you ever had God say, I've talked and talked and talked, and I'm done talking with you about it? All that he had done for Jonah. He's done. So, so Lord, help us to see ourselves as we are, if there be any wicked way in us, help us to see our blind spots. Help us, Lord, to see if there's attitudes and prejudices and judgments against people groups that should not be there. We pray, Lord, that you would help us. 
and reveal to us what we need to see. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Well, so here we are. Jonah has been delivered in spite of his attitudes, in spite of his efforts to flee. Aren't you glad that God is gracious with us? <clears throat> in spite of his uh, rebellion, God has continued to work with this old crusty prophet. And then you, <laughs> you find him delivered from a storm, delivered from a big fish, Vomited up on dry land. Pardon the expression, but it's in the Bible. Finds himself on dry land, no doubt, covered in seaweed and God knows what else. Gets up, cleans himself off, and decides that he's going to at least obey on the outside. And he goes and preaches, and there's a tremendous move of God and a revival in Nineveh. From a short sermon, by the way. People are turned around. The city is completely revived. And now he's mad. He's mad. We find him complaining in verses 1 and 2. He said it displeased Jonah. And not just a little bit, exceedingly. I mean, Jonah is angry. Angry. And he became so angry, the Bible says. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? That this was going to happen? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish as if to justify all of his previous actions. For I know that you are gracious and merciful. I knew you'd do this, you good God. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're slow to anger, far more patient than I am. You're abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So Jonah reverts to making accusations against God because he's angry. No, they're kind of safe accusations. You know, making a point, kind of making a point, not liking this, but yet, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we could call them backhanded compliments. I'm not sure. But they're certainly not given with the right attitude. And there's a tremendous difference between God's attitude and Jonah's attitude. God was willing to offer love and mercy, forgiveness and grace, but Jonah was relentlessly unforgiving and angry. And it didn't matter what God wanted. How often does our attitude trip us up in the same way? It doesn't matter what God wants. It's what I want. It's what I really want in this situation. Whether God approves of this person I'm to marry or not, doesn't matter. It's what I want. Doesn't matter what God wants. No matter where it gets me, it's what I want. I want it now. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of it. And uh, Jonah's relentless. He's unforgiving and angry. So God says, forgive. And oftentimes we refuse. God says, embrace. And we reject. God says, go to them. And we run away from them. God at times can decide to work through something we may not like, and it may not fit our tradition, it may not fit our culture, and therefore our attitude causes us to miss God in the middle of all of his maneuvering, and we miss the big picture because it doesn't fit where we're at. You know, you say, well, there's other places, and the Bible's full of these places. I was actually just thinking about this message this week, and I was reminded of 2 Samuel chapter 6. David is uh, so excited. One of his main goals, top three goals when he took over the kingdom was to bring the ark back to the, to the city of Jerusalem. And he's so excited because that meant the presence of God is coming back with the ark. So he journeys and goes and gets the ark. And uh, it's a quite a big deal. And he finds himself dancing as he leads a parade back into the city. And he's got, oh, Mikhail, the king's uh, daughter, staring out the window, his wife, by the way, and she's angry because he's dancing, takes off his kingly garments, his robes, and lays them down and becomes as a common man, and he dances with them. And that makes her angry. After all, she's the king's daughter. I've heard a lot of talking about this passage, but I really think what he did that made her so angry was he broke daddy's etiquette. He broke daddy's tradition, the manual on how to be a respectable king. And David saw himself as one of the people. He didn't see himself up here. He saw himself as one of the people. So he's leading them in worship and delighting and getting down on their level and leading them to a great God who was the ultimate king anyway. And Michal gets so angry. You know the story. Many of you know it. In 2 Samuel 6, judgment comes her way and she's not allowed to bear children. Missing God. Missing what he's up to. 
Missing what he's doing when it comes to unity and missing what he's doing when he's trying to coach us and teach us how to love and bring back together, how to heal, how to mend. And if it doesn't fit our tradition, we can get real angry and upset and misread and Great Creek and we find ourselves getting perceptions and having assumptions that are not even true. But aren't you glad God's in control and he knows what he's doing? Can we pause right here and give him praise for that, that he knows what he's doing and he is working. He's working in a big way. I promise you he is. Back to Jonah. First, uh, his complaining refers to uh, his assignment. His complaining about his assignment. Jonah obeyed without expecting God would do anything in Nineveh. I mean, I really think he thought, well, I'll go do it. And he, you know, his problem is it was always about him. He couldn't see beyond himself. So, so he thinks, well, God wants me to be obedient, and he's forcing me to be obedient. He's testing me and my obedience. That's the way we fall into that and not even see the big picture, what God's really wanting to do. And so he thought perhaps that there'd be no change, and it was obviously a half-hearted attempt to say that he had been obedient without really believing that God would love Nineveh enough to save them. After all, how could he? Because I don't. It's also obvious to me that Jonah finally relented, stood down, and obeyed God by going to Nineveh, but his heart was never in it. Yeah, aren't you glad that, you know, preachers might not have their heart in it, but the word doesn't return void? I mean, the word did the job. It wasn't old Jonah. All he did is open his mouth, and the word was distributed. What God got, you know, it's not always about you when you're singing your song or speaking your message or, or teaching your, your lesson. I mean, I think we just ought to throw this out here. The word doesn't return, but it's always about the word. It's not always about the messenger. So the resistance and rebellion is mind-boggling, and you see when God assigns to us a responsibility, Listen to me. When God assigns to you a responsibility, it's never just about you. It's never about you. Teacher, those children that are in your classroom, it's not just about you and the paycheck you get. We're all thankful for that, and you, and you should get paid and paid well. But it's not about you. He's brought children into that classroom that you're to have an impact on. Ministries that way. Living in neighborhoods that way. It's not about you. Um, you see, when God assigns to us responsibility, it's not about us. Um, I could even take this further. Fathers, you think it's all about you and your marriage and family? It's not always about you and what you want. It's not always about you. Provision through work. That provision you're getting from your job, it's not always about you and how happy you are. What does God do with that paycheck? He feeds a family at home. You've got relationships at work that you're strategically placed there to make a difference while God has you there. Dwelling places and neighborhoods. Perhaps it's not by chance you're in that neighborhood. God has you there. Do you believe that today? Amen. Holy assignments. Not only does Jonah complain about his assignment, secondly, he complains about God's attributes. Can you see? I mean, this is crazy. He complains about God's attributes. I know that you're gracious. I know that you're merciful. You don't have to tell me that. I know that. Slow to anger. An abundant loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. I really like it, especially when it has to do with uh, the people of Israel and myself. But I don't like it. I don't like it when you share it. I do not like the fact that you love those people and want to save them. I mean, do you like what God likes? Do you like what God likes? Do you like what God likes? Do you love what God loves? And perhaps not, and that's where we've got to get the Jonah attitude out of ourselves. To be effective in this world in which we live, we can't be as selective. We have to get the Jonah attitude out of ourselves. And notice Jonah's conversation, verses 3 through 5. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. I mean, that's sad. Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I mean, I'm really upset. And then the Lord said, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, doesn't even answer, he goes out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there he made himself a little shelter, <clears throat> sat under it in the shade. I imagine in my mind he had a little elevation, till he might see what would become of the city. Um, Jonah's request here is just take my life. You see, Jonah didn't want these people to repent. He didn't want them to enjoy the blessings that God had privileged. And he was so desperate about this. I don't want to see it. If I've got to watch this, kill me so I don't have to look at it. I mean, that's some serious hate. 
I told you. I knew you'd react this way. And uh, I don't want them people to have the privileges that I have. I don't want them people to have the privileges that my people have. My people have privileges. I don't want those people to have those privileges. L listen to me, Americans. I don't want those people to have those privileges. There are privileges. Really? Are they yours or are they God's? Boy, it's getting quiet. God sees the human race. He loves people. He dies for the whosoever. He gave himself for the whosoever. We have to be about the whosoever. Do you love people today? Can we love people? Can we love people more today than we did yesterday? If we do, we got to get that Jonah attitude out of ourselves. Let's give the Lord praise for love. He loves, he loves, he loves. That's why this message is so powerful. As this prophecy was presented to the people of Israel, watch this. As this prophecy was presented to the people of Israel, God showed them that in and through their attitudes, they were very much like their own spokesman, Jonah. And here's God's reasoning, secondly. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? We're under Jonah's conversation. Is it right for you to be angry? Are you not blessed? Are you not, are you not uh, taken care of, Jonah? Are you not taken care of? And so we see God's reasoning. Are you not blessed and taken care of? Why do you hate it when I try to bless somebody else? Why do we hate it when God tries to bless somebody else? Why? And the Lord asked him that question, and notice Jonah's reaction, pouting. But I tell you, the more I read this, the more angry I get at Jonah. Chapter 4 really ticks me off. And I did pretty good through chapter 3. The Lord shows his great mercy and gets him out of the belly of the fish, and you get to chapter 4, and you just want to, I, mean, I want to do a beat down. Jonah's got a pitiful reaction, pouting. I mean, he's even praying, but he's praying with an agenda, just like you and I. He prays, praying. He's talking to God. But his agenda's not right. His heart's not right. He's selfish. He's manipulative. And now we need to understand Jonah here. Now, let's try to understand him and put his sandals on a moment. He, he, he had had it with the Assyrians. The people of Israel were also fed up with the Assyrians. The people had been violent and cruel toward Israel. We know that. So Israel's bitterness was understandable. But if anyone has a right and a reason to be bitter, God does. If anyone has a right to be bitter, God does. But instead, God prefers to exhibit grace, forgiveness, love, and mercy in the face of our bitterness. And sometimes we don't like that. In fact, we can't stand it. Simply put, God loves people. So Jonah goes outside the city on, on a little elevation and sets up a little booth in the hot sun with a little shade, hoping to see God's judgment ultimately come upon Nineveh because certainly this repentance that they're practicing is not sustainable. These people are too evil. It will not be sustainable. He's basically laying in the weeds waiting for a big failure that he's predicting for Nineveh and he hopes that Nineveh, Ninevites uh, repentance won't be sustainable and that they will experience nothing less than God's brutal, heavy-handed judgment, which God did say was part of the message. But in that message, it was laced with grace. And he's wanting God to destroy them in spite of his own preaching. And you get to God's correction. And the Lord prepared a plant, made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. And obviously the sun is hot. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. I mean, Jonah loves blessings. Don't we all love blessings? Ooh. So God looks down at this crusty old prophet sitting there, getting a sunstroke, and he provides a vine for him. And when the shade from the vine reaches Jonah, he is thrilled at what God has done. And Jonah thought, surely God must be with me. Look, we're, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God's, uh, God must be with me. Have you ever been that way? I must have it right. My attitude must be right because God's blessing me. 
Be careful. Oh, I got a job. I'm making it. Got a house. We're blessed in our nation. Certainly God must be with us. Here's a fact where God was blessing, but oh, it's about to turn around. God must be blessing me. But watch this, and God provides a worm. Oh, gosh. I mean, this worm chews on that vine, and the whole thing disintegrates, and now Jonah is more than angry. I mean, he's spitting nails. I don't know what the cuss word sounded like, but I guarantee he was cussing. As the morning dawned, the Bible says the next day God prepared this worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Jonah comes to this conclusion, it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, you're just playing with me. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Is it right for you to be angry when he removes a blessing that he gives you? You get the blessing and then he removes it from you and now you're angry? And Jonah argued, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, which are more than 120,000 people who cannot discern from the right hand to their left? And plus they have a lot of livestock. I want you to notice a couple things here. Notice that Jonah is not angry just because his shade had been taken away. He's upset because his lovely little vine that had a chance to grow has been eaten by this wretched worm. And that's just not fair. So God asked him, do you have a right to be angry about this vine? And Jonah replies in the verse, I am angry about to die. I want to die. So Jonah's anger infested. He's becoming more and more bitter. So God really speaks to him in strong words. Listen, Jonah, I provided shelter for you and you don't want me to provide shelter for these people? You're upset about a vine that you had nothing to do with except to enjoy its benefits, but you have no interest whatsoever in this city? Have you ever noticed that sometimes God's people can be very bitter? Sometimes they get themselves all worked up about plants, animals, music, environments, dress, styles, ministry methods, the environment, yet they could care less about a perishing world. They could care less about the neighbors that God has called us to. And all of the things mentioned are fine. I'm not against any of those things. They're causes, but those causes should never trump or transcend the need for us to love people and love our world and do a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's our ultimate holy assignment. Yes, my people. Yes, my people, I believe God is saying. You know, God has no Gentile complex. God has no color complex. God has no status complex. God has no complexes. The walls we build, God doesn't have those complexes. God says, be there for my people. Be there for my people. God doesn't have an incarceration or incarcerated complex because people in jail, they should never have another chance. Aren't you glad that's not God? Why are we that way? We find ways to justify it. Why are we that way? So notice God's form of communication as I prepare to wrap this up. Here's what God does with one rotten attitude. He's controlled the circumstances around him, trying to get his attention. That's what God does. He'll control our circumstances and his grace. Jonah kept choosing to go down, down, down. And what does God do? Rescue, rescue, rescue. All because of his love for Jonah and the holy assignment, his love for Nineveh. He loves Jonah, he loves Nineveh. And there he is, controlling his circumstances. Thank God he sent a fish going the opposite way at the right time. And can God do that stuff? Orchestrate, organize, get ahead of you. You don't see what he's up to. Thank God there's some fish that have come by my path and rescued me. So he controls circumstances. That's what he does with people with rotten attitudes. He may control some circumstances to get your attention. 
But he not only controls circumstances, he has conversations. Even when you're, even when you're rotten in your attitude, God is still willing to talk to you. Even when you've got stinking thinking, God is still willing to talk to you. Aren't you grateful for that? God keeps talking to him and conversing with him and wanting conversation with him. That's what God does. He controls the circumstances and then he has conversations all in an effort to get you where he wants to get you and I. Then he offers clear revelation. You know, this comes along a little harder. He lets some hot sun beat down on your head for a while and then raise up a blessing to show you, hey, I love you so much, I'm in control here. And out of that, out of that, he allows the blessing to be taken away and he then tells you, here's the revelation. You ought to be able to figure it out. It shouldn't take a brain surgeon to figure some of this stuff out that we bring upon ourselves. People come along and say, what's God saying? Well, what is he saying? All you got to do is read the tea leaves. Clear revelation. He provides that for Jonah. So here's what we got. Controlled circumstances. Controlling Jonah's circumstances. He's having conversation with Jonah. He brings clear revelation. And then he's had enough. I only remember once or perhaps twice. But I'd gotten some pretty serious trouble. As a teenager, and I remember my dad, who was not a person of many words. My mother was a person with a lot of words. But my dad said, I don't even need to talk to you about this. You know. And I remember him walking away. It's probably the second most difficult discipline. I'd rather he smack me. The first discipline that... He did with me, and some of you won't like it. It doesn't matter. He did it, and it worked. He made me spank him because I stole some things, and those things were getting bigger, and he began to realize I had the problem of a thief as a seven-year-old child. My dad came in, and he had talked and talked to me about it. He unbuttoned his shirt, and he made me spank him, made me beat him. Now, I don't know if you're a psychologist. I don't know what you think about that. I will tell you, I never touched something again. He said, I'm the fault because I'm, I'm not getting through to you, and I'm raising you in a way. I'm failing. And he made me spank him. Now, we only did that once. Second time, my dad really got involved was when he walked away. And I remember that hurt. Wasn't a whole lot of words. He said, you already know. And he walked away. Silent treatment. Have you ever been so disobedient that you ignored the conversations, you ignored the controlled circumstances, you ignored the clear revelation, and you got so far out there that God walked away? This book ends in a very strange way, unlike really any other book. It's like, uh, hey, I've tried everything I know to try, and I'm done. So would you stand with me? And here's what he did. He simply said, you're dismissed. I'm done with you. That's what he said. God bless you. Have a great day.